just like the great speaker and what turns out to be an incredibly Um, the book itself, Doug Ray, is, is somebody that you should definitely uh, spend a lot of time on recovering um, many books he wrote. Um, there's one book, in, one book um, that he's very famous for is called The Origins of British Bolshevism, which is obscurely uh, published as Labour Party. But my favourite title, and it's probably, it, it, it relates to tonight, Tony to Squarely, is um, his book on John S. Clark. Uh, the subtitle, of which, the subtitle of which is Parliamentarian, Poet, and Lion Tamer. Sure. So um, there's some, you know, the, 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 the various um, of the material we covered in terms of uh, individuals, working class history, a history of the miners' associations in the Chartist period. Um, a fantastic life. The book itself um, is a collection of essays. Uh, it was first published in 1995, but there are essays in there today all the way back to 19, the early 1970s. And it is a brilliant and uh, very much a timely book. I don't know if you're as sick of the keep calm and carry on post as I, I am, but the book is the most, is the sharpest scalpel for that. The myths that surround the Second World War that have been spun and were saturated with even, even up, up until today. It starts out essentially by saying the ruling class in Britain, Western Europe, all of the all of the Allied countries, very much learned the lesson of the end of the First World War, which was to never let the train from arrive at Finland Station ever again. And what he's referencing there was the notion that the lessons learned in being able to, being able to control, corral, and sell the idea of war into deeply recalcitrant populations were very much a part of the package that came with learning, for the ruling class, learning the lessons of, uh, of the Russian Revolution, and not to repeat that. So he goes through a whole series of examples of undermining the, essentially the myth that we were somehow all in it together during the war. The, the myth that the Tory party conference is playing out, that the, the appropriate response to austerity was essentially to all pull together for one common goal, we're all Brits together, there's no, there are no, uh, there are no differentiations. Um, and he uses brilliant concrete examples of that. For example, down the street during the Blitz, from here, um, you had the Dorchester Hotel, lovely all night with underground bunkers, which included games rooms, 24-hour waiter services, um, um, uh, incredibly well-reinforced structures, while down in the Isle of Dogs, which is the east of the working class district of East London, you had something like 8,000 people um, cramming into uh, the dockside warehouses each night, sharing eight toilets in one toilet location in the middle He talks about the riots in Portsmouth, riots in which two people died to gain access to air raid shelters during the bombing. He talks about the way the colouring coding that we're used to now, you know, the red, orange and green alerts for threat levels were actually modified during the war. So they included a purple. And purple was introduced as a threat level that meant we know that there are uh, Axis bombers coming over your factory, so it seems too important for you to, for the war effort for you to disrupt the factory by going into the shelter, carry on work. So there's so there, there are multiple examples of um, of, uh, of, of how the class differentiation in Britain was 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 amplified actually in, in, in the Second World War and resulted in all sorts of different areas in which organised resistance to the war could operate. And that's a history that's basically hidden from view. We have no idea, for example, that the the anarchist press, uh, the peace nets, and very very few Trotskyists were able to penetrate. Um, the armed forces in the UK. Uh, nobody mentions the wave of mutiny that happened at the end of the Second World War, the biggest one obviously being in North Africa, um, and where, you know, these are just considered to be spontaneous eruptions of unrest. In fact, they were built by individuals not soldiers within the army itself. In fact, to convey a bit of Gray's um, um, uh, humour, the first meeting he went to was a meeting in a church hall up in, um, I think it's in Lancaster, um, where, which was a 
attacked by the home guard. Now, for people who don't know what the home guard is, I mean, at the moment, people here have seen Dad and Army. But basically, it was the older workforce foraged for a reserve army to, to, uh, to in the worst case scenario, if Britain was invaded, they'd be the last line of defense. The home guard um, went to the meeting that Ray was at, an ILP meeting, an anti war meeting, in 1944. 